Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering anxiety and the different types of anxiety that you need to be familiar with because these concepts have been seen not only on NCLEX, but also on HESI, ATI, especially the psych mental health portion. Okay, if you haven't done so already, guys, please do not forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. All right, guys, let's get started. So as you can see here, where it says anxiety, it can be defined as a feeling of apprehension, uneasiness, uncertainty, or dread resulting from a real or perceived threat. So that threat may not even be real, but the person who's experiencing that feeling perceives whatever it is as a threat, and they have all of these feelings. Look at this. Fear is a reaction to a specific danger, whereas anxiety is a vague sense of dread related to an unspecified or unknown danger. So it's like that person has a feeling that something bad is going to happen. Now, let's start talk about normal anxiety. Normal anxiety is a healthy reaction necessary for survival. So if you know, you're walking to your car at night and it's dark and you hear footsteps, Normal anxiety will make you more aware of your surroundings, make you pick up your pace, may make you pull your keys out, right, to get to your car quickly. So normal, uh, normal anxiety is good for survival. Without anxiety, our ancestors would have had little motivation to run from the saber-toothed tiger or hunt the mastodon. Anxiety provides the energy needed to carry out the tasks involved in living and striving towards goals. Very important. And I'm going to get into it in a little bit when we talk about the different types of anxiety. So let's start with mild anxiety. And as you can see, guys, I put a happy face next to it because for testing purposes, you need to know that mild anxiety is a good thing. Mild anxiety is what pushes you to do what you're supposed to do instead of, you know, just doing nothing. So look what it says, mild anxiety, this occurs in the normal experiences of everyday life living and allows an individual to perceive reality in sharp focus. So you have anxiety, but it's mild. You're able to focus on your environment. You know what's going on around you. For example, if I'm your instructor, you have a test coming up, you know, I don't play with my tests. You know that, right? So mild anxiety does what? Tell you to study. Instead of going to sleep or hanging out with your friends or going to a movie, that mild anxiety, because, you know, Professor D doesn't play, pushes you to get up and do what you're supposed to do to study. Now, look at moderate anxiety. Moderate anxiety sees, hears, and grasps less information and may demonstrate selective inattention in which only certain things in the environment are seen or heard unless they're pointed out. So let me stop right there. When a patient has mild anxiety, Okay, they're still in touch with reality. They're still aware of their environment, but they're not as aware of their environment as they were with mild anxiety, because with moderate anxiety, the focus now has shifted more to that source, okay, of the anxiety. The, it, excuse me, the ability to think clearly is hampered. So they're not thinking clearly as 100% as they were in mild anxiety. Why? Because more of that focus is towards the source of anxiety. So the ability to think is hampered, but learning and problem solving can still take place, although not at the optimum level. So they can still problem solve. They can still learn, but not at the best as they would as if they only had mild anxiety, okay? But like I said, they're still aware of their environment. They're still able to process thoughts. It's just not at the highest level as they would have in mild anxiety. Look at severe anxiety. We talked about this a million times. I told you, whenever you see severe in front of anything, it's not a good thing, right? Severe anxiety, patient may focus on one particular detail or many scattered details and have difficulty noticing what's going on in the environment, even when another points it out. So we went from mild anxiety to, which is a good thing that makes you, you know, do what you're supposed to do. You're fully aware of your environment. You can see the big picture to moderate anxiety where you're still able to think you're still able to learn, but just not at that high level, right? to now severe anxiety where you are focused on one tiny little detail or a whole bunch of tiny little details, but you can't look at that big picture altogether. You're unable to focus on that, all right? 
And last, panic. Once a patient hits panic, they are out of touch with, with their environment. They cannot focus. So here is when I see panic coming up on uh, nursing exams, what I see that they're trying to pull from you is for you to understand when the patient's in panic mode, you can't do teaching. Why? They can't focus. They can't process thoughts. They can't learn when they are in panic mode. So before you can do teaching for a patient, you have to bring that level of anxiety down. So that's very important for you guys to know. Look at this. Panic is the most extreme level of anxiety and results in markedly dysregulated behavior. Someone in the state of panic is unable to process what's going on in the environment and they may, may lose touch with reality. What's that called when somebody loses touch with reality? That's called um, psychosis. They have completely lost touch with reality. So uh, one more thing I'm gonna show you guys before I let you go. Let's look at this table. I love this table, different levels of anxiety. We talked about it already, but I wanna bring to your attention, I've said this to you guys many times, whenever you're studying and you notice that the author, excuse me, <clears throat> hold on guys. You notice that the author gave you certain information in text and the same thing that they told you in text, they're now putting it in a table or a diagram or a chart or a figure or whatever, an illustration. It's gonna be a test question. I'm telling you now, as a student, you're going to see it somewhere. It's important to know. So everything we just talked about, we're seeing it again in another format, which is a table. So just a reminder, because I promise you're going to see this again. You need to know it. Again, I put the happy face next to the mild. In mild anxiety, they have heightened perceptual field, so, which means they're on alert because they're on alert so they can know if they need to fight or flight, right? So they're fully aware of their environment. They're aware of their anxiety, which is a good thing, by the way. I put a star next to this, and this has been seen on NCLEX. You need to know this. Mild and moderate levels of anxiety can alert the person that something is wrong and can stimulate appropriate action, fight or flight. What are you going to do? So those are good things, guys. Physical or other characteristics, slight discomfort, easily startled. Why are they easily startled? Because they're on edge. They're vigilant. Mild tension relieving behaviors. I've seen this as select all that apply. So make sure you know them. What are they? Uh, foot or finger tapping, lip chewing, fidgeting. Why? Again, they're on edge. Now, moderate anxiety, they're more fo focused on the source of the anxiety. Okay. Remember in mild, they were focused on the environment. They were looking at the big picture. But when you they have moderate anxiety, and moderate anxiety, they're more focused on the source of anxiety rather than the whole environment, okay? They're less able to pay attention. They can still pay attention. They can still process thoughts. They can still learn, just not at the optimal level. They're able to solve problems, again, but not at optimal ability. Severe, I talked to you guys about severe. Look, um, their perceptual field is greatly um, reduced and it can even be distorted. And you guys can take a look at this on your own. And last, panic. Out of touch with reality, cannot learn, cannot focus. Don't try teaching them when they're at this level. You have to bring that anxiety for, uh, down first. They're unable to attend to the environment. The focus is lost. They may feel these two guys have been seen on all three NCLEX, uh, ATI, HESTI. So you have to know the difference. Look at this. Focus is lost, may feel unreal. That's the depersonalization or that the world is unreal. That is your derealization. You have to know the difference between the two. So when that person themselves feel like they're unreal, that's the depersonalization. When they feel like the world is unreal, that's derealization, okay? They're unable to process thoughts. They're unable to process what's happening. They experience terror and that terror may cause them to be immobile. They see the danger, that tiger is right. Well, you know, good luck running away from a tiger. That's not a good example, but whatever. The danger is right there and they're 
in such a panic state, they're mobilized, they can't move. In mobility or severe hyperreactivity or flight, they get so scared, they jump off a building, okay? They could go from one end of the spectrum to the other. Somatic complaints, you guys need to understand what that word somatic means. When a patient has somatic complaints, that means they have physical complaints, but the stem of those physical complaints is psychological. So for example, a woman that is so worried that her husband's going to leave her, she's worried about the husband's going to leave her, but that worries that worry manifests in a physical way. They have a stomach ache, they have a headache. So when you see that word, somatic complaints, those are physical uh, um, uh, manifestations we see, but the root of those physical manifestations are really psychological. So what are the somatic complaints? Numbness or tingling, shortness of breath, a dizziness, chest pain, uh, nausea, trembling, chills, overheating, palpitations. They may have serious, uh, severe withdrawal, and they will be likely out of touch with reality, <coughs> excuse me, which means that they'll most likely be experiencing psychosis. Okay, guys, like I said, I promise this was a short uh, video. I just wanted to make sure that you guys understood the differences in anxiety. Please sound off in the comments. Let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know if you'd like me to go in deeper about anxiety, the nursing interventions, the teachings, all that good stuff, or if there's something else that you'd like to see me cover as a lesson format and I haven't covered it already. Thank you so much for watching this video, guys, and you'll see me on the next one.